Thank you, everyone. Um, so my name is Divya, and um, as uh, Thomas said, I work at Adobe. And I'm a product manager for the web engine team at Adobe. What that means is that um, we work on specifications. We uh, try to propose specifications that we think would be useful for web developers and designers, and also try to implement it in WebKit so we can hopefully see it in Safari or Chrome. So what I will be speaking about today, you may uh, see some of those specifications in addition to others. But before I go into my talk itself, uh, I'd like to clarify one thing, because this is something that you keep seeing all the time. Because there is HTML5, there is a view that there is something known as CSS3. And then everyone talks about CSS3 stuff, CSS blah, 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 this and that. So uh, I'd like to clarify there is no such thing as CSS3. So what happened was that uh, for 10 years, the CSS working group that works on these specifications um, worked on creating what is known as uh, the CSS 2.1 specification. And once that got over, uh, they started splitting things into modules so that, it, that they don't have to do that kind of uh, hard work over 10 years anymore. And now each of these specifications into different modules. But the thing is, each of these models are versioned. So you have backgrounds and borders module, and then there is the level three, because 2.1 consider is considered the level two of that module. And so there is also a level four of that module, because there are ideas that they want to work on, but they don't have time to work on right now. So they would uh, push it into level four and keep it there. So anything I'm going to talk about is just un like no CSS3, CSS4. It's just things that you may be interested in, that you may see in the future. And so what I like to speak about is things um, in these broad areas. The first is typography, the second layout, then graphics, and uh, then some stuff that's not in any uh, proper, in any browser yet to test, but it's interesting to know. And maybe if you have time, something known as uh, responsible web design. So let's go into the first one that I like to speak about. And uh, that's this clock that we've been staring at for a while. It looks like a, uh, something from Tron, but um, how many of you have seen this before? This is not something that I did, but how many of you have seen this thing before? Raise your hands. Anyone? Oh, so few. Okay, so you guys are not supposed to answer this question. So I would like to ask you all, what do you think was used to create this? Is it Canvas? Is it JavaScript? Is it pure CSS? Um, or anything else? Anyone? Shout out your answers. Just shout out. No, no, you don't. No, not Thomas. Anyone else? CSS? Others? That's it? One answer? Just because I'm going to speak about CSS doesn't mean I'll be speaking about CSS. So um, here is the markup. Here is the time. And then I have a href. And if you see, there is text. That's the actual time. And uh, I have a font. I'm not sure if you can see. There's a font family here. Uh, let's see what happens if I remove this font. And then so if I remove this font, I get actual text back. So what was used to create this thing that you saw was a font. And the way it is created is using what is known as ligatures. And now ligatures are these features in fonts that allow you to combine two characters together and uh, rep represent that two characters with one character. So you may have seen ligatures typically in wedding invites, because you'll have the F and L. When they combine together, you have the curve, the L, F, leading into the curve of the L and all those fancy you know, flourishes that you see on the alphabets and so on. So the way you used to be able to use these ligatures is that uh, it will be specified in a features file format for open type fonts. And uh, then uh, applications that can understand that feature file would try to read and uh, show it to you. So till very recently, browsers did not have that ability to read those, uh, that feature file and use those flourishes or things that were available. And now, so there's a person who creates this font uh, editing app called Glyphs App, and uh, he created this font, what, uh, which takes advantage of ligature. So uh, it represents the combination of the whole time into a, uh, into a glyph. So every time that combination changes, it changes the, uh, the clock, which is why you see the clock moving the way it is. And uh, this you can enable by... Uh, this feature property, you need to specify that you want this ligatures enabled. And uh, you do that by having a font feature settings. 
So you have something known as font feature settings, and then you say you want the normal ligatures enabled. You also want the discretionary ligatures enabled. And that's how uh, you can enable this open type clock, oops, which is basically created by this person and uh, to have this to happen. So uh, this is, ligatures are, uh, this kind of font feature settings is supported by uh, Chrome, Safari, IE, and Firefox. So you almost have uh, full browser support. So you can start, almost start using this now. And um, the other one that I want to talk about is uh, Unicode. So how many of you know what is encoding? OK, few people. So for the rest of those, uh, a very basic and most probably wrong, theoretically wrong explanation of encoding is that um, when, when, an, uh, when you get text back from the server, the browser needs to understand you know, the bytes, like what is the byte? They need to understand what kind of text it is. And so there is a common standard that is used to understand uh, the text, and there are different kinds of formats. Uh, there's diff different ways of encoding, and the most popular or accepted way of encoding is Unicode. Now, what Unicode is is basically is just a set of tables, and there is uh, each of these uh, each of these values are called code, code points. And each code point, you will have an acceptable uh, thing that people have agreed on as a representation of a character or a glyph. So all of these fonts, what they do is they just have Unicode tables and they have a representation that would be used to represent that code point. And now uh, in, uh, so the, so in font face, so you, uh, people know about font faces, web, that's what you use to define web fonts and stuff. So in font face, there's a property known as Unicode range. And what that property allows you to do is to say, or tell the browser that when you come across these characters that are within this range of Unicode uh, code points, make sure you use this font to render those characters. So in this example, um, it, you know, it used to be a fad about five years ago to use like very uh, decorative and signs. And uh, people used to go to the lens of going to the server and parsing the entire text on the server and adding like a span class is equal to amp and then go to your CSS file and change the particular and sign to have a different font and so on. So in this case, what I have here is just plain text. Uh, and let's look at that. Uh, it just is a href and this and that. That's, that's all I have. There is no span, nothing of that kind. And the way it works is that I have in the CSS a font face declaration a rule and where I say declare a font family called ampersand and that font family I have a Unicode range specified which is basically just that and character so there is no range it's just one character and so what this makes the browser and then I declare that in this main selector you need to use the ampersand font and the sans serif font so because I do this the browser will see the and character and say hey that's a Unicode that this style she tells me I should use the, that specific font and then uses that font to render that and character and then the rest of the characters remain the same. Now this is actually was not made for this use case. There is an actual real reason to use it which is that when you have a multilingual uh, text so you may have like Ni Hao someone and then uh, how do you represent those that Ni Hao Chinese characters and then the English character. So typically, if you receive emails from people uh, who uh, most commonly write in Japanese or Chinese, you would see that the English characters are in a not usual readable font. font. This is because the application uses a system default to render that English character. So in the browsers, now we have control over which font you use to render those English characters. And you can do that with Unicode range. So you can say Unicode range and put the Unicode uh, range for Latin characters and say which font you want to use for those characters. Some people have tried to uh, master this by using, uh, I mean, try to hack this by saying, uh, using the private range Unicode uh, ra uh, tables. So there's in the Unicode tables, there's a private use space. And so they have tried to create their own custom fonts, uh, which are basically icon fonts, and use that range to uh, specify those fonts so you can use it as icons in your uh, web apps. And I think this is what GitHub does. I'm, I'm not quite sure. But once we go beyond this, uh, this is all I have about typography. And Unicode range is supported in all browsers. So you can start using it uh, immediately. 
So once we go beyond typography, then there is the layout that we could talk about. And in layout, there are a bunch of new specifications. And one of the specifications that Adobe has initially proposed and is we are just working on is something known as exclusions. And now what exclusions allows you to do is to uh, create custom text wrapping. So here is an example of how that custom text wrapping works. So uh, if it is not very obvious, uh, it's uh, the text is wrapped in the shape of a crow. And um, so this is done by using a property known as shape inside. Let's show this. So I have a paragraph, and I have a property that's prefixed, known as WebKit shape inside. And then it takes a function, which is a polygon here. And then the format of this uh, property is similar to SVG paths. So it almost uses the same uh, syntax. And uh, what this would do is to tell the text uh, that it needs to be uh, wrapped within this shape that's been defined. So there's also uh, another property called shape outside that you may use, uh, but it's not in any browser yet. So as this property is also only available in Chrome Canary, and, is, and you need to uh, enable um, experiment, uh, experimental, experimental WebKit features, and that's how you can get to see the shape inside, or shape outside, uh, the shape inside property to work. So uh, this will give you better control over how you can uh, wrap the text. Uh, previously, you only were able to wrap text with just in rectangular blocks, boxes. And um, so while this is only supported in Chrome, Canary now, hopefully we'll see this an uh, implementation soon in uh, other browsers. And uh, the next one that I would like to show you is, oh, before I go, there's a tool called, um, there's, a tool, there's a polygon drawing tool that uh, uh, Bear Travis, who's a member of my team, created. So what this would do is you can specify, create your own shape, and then uh, use the copy command to copy that polygon and use it in your own CSS if you want to experiment with the shape. So the other one that I like to talk about is known as regions. Now regions is uh, another specification that Adobe proposed and what uh, this allows you to do is that you can flow con content from content, Jed, thanks. <laughs> uh, from one container to uh, another container and so you can have like a layout container, and then you can have a content container. And then you can say the, the, uh, the elements of this content container should go into this, what is known as a flow. And then you can tell the layout containers that, hey, just render the elements that are in this flow. And the way, and here is how you declare those things. So here's the content co uh, container, and then I have a paragraph element, and then I have a property called flow into, and that declares that this element P the, needs to be part of that named flow called poem flow. And then uh, in the layout section, I have uh, the layout specified, and I have an empty div. And then I say this div needs to take the elements from this named flow called poem flow. And there's also ways to debug this, and uh, there's a uh, thing, especially in, this is all in Chrome Canary, and uh, let's see. So you have the named flow, and then it tells you what's the, con uh, what's the content, what are the parts of the content element. Then it tells you what is the region that p becomes part of that uh, named flow. And there's also this icon, I'm not sure if you can see, it tells you that there's the content is overflowing, so you can't, that there's content that's not visible on the screen, but it's still uh, hidden, but it's part of that uh, development. So again, this is also only available in Chrome Canary and as part of the experimental uh, the features that is available in the Chrome flag. Um, there's also Flexbox and Grid that are also pretty exciting uh, new features in CSS, but I'm not going to talk about it because I uh, don't quite know much about that uh, to talk about. And Flexbox, anyway, is almost ready to use, so I think you should uh, start looking at it and see if you can use it. OK, so the next part of my presentation is about graphics. And uh, I'd like to sp the first thing I would like to speak about is filters. Now, filters are like image processing functions that you can use on HTML elements via CSS. And the way you would do that is to use a property called filter and then use a filter function. Uh, it could be blur, it could be grayscale, drop shadow, uh, sepia, and so on. And then pass arguments to that filter function depending on what function you're using. So if you're using blur, you'd be possibly saying 10px or 20px or something. 
So here's uh, a demo that someone created. It's very evil because um, it uses the deprecated map and area properties, uh, elements, sorry, uh, to create this kind of effect, which is very interesting. So if I hover on this, this comes into focus and everything else blurs out. So uh, the camera comes into focus, the lens comes into focus, and so on. It's all done by uh, filters. Not sure if you can show it here. So you have a filter, blur, and that's how um, it works. So uh, these functions that I just mentioned, like the blur, grayscale, drop shadow, they're all what is known as native filters. And um, native filters are basically uh, part of, it's in the specification. So these are uh, filters that are available to you because the browser provides them. You can also use your own custom filters. And the way that you would do that is to use what is known as shaders. Now, shaders are, there are two kinds of shaders. There is a fragment shader and there is a vertex shader. And shaders are typically have been used to provide, uh, you know, to create like 3D uh, rendering and textures on WebGL. So if you've seen a lot of WebGL experiments, they always use shaders to create that texture and the way the elements look, appear 3D. And now what uh, custom filters allow you to do is it provides a function called custom and you can mix in these shaders. And so the browser will look at the selectors that use this uh, filter property with the custom function and then uh, create vertices uh, for that particular uh, element and then pass them through the shaders and then render the final output on the screen. So they do this on the GPU, which is why you don't uh, see the, you know, your browsers don't crash and your computer doesn't do a blue screen of death and so on. So this happens on the GPU, it's much more faster and uh, then final result is output on the screen. So uh, our team put, put together the CSS filter lab, uh, which allows you to experiment with different kinds of filters. So here I have a custom filter called crumple and let me refresh this. Oh wow, this, huh. So you can, uh, the shader is also taken parameters, so you can specify the hum amount by which you want to crumple it or uh, do a tile flip or different things that you can do. So you can apply, and the resulting out, you, know, you can use this property and have this apply to uh, your own code. So I want to use this on the custom filters and uh, so uh, the clock, so basically I have this clock and then uh, I have this uh, shader that's using a tile flip. And I'm using this in conjunction with the animation uh, uh, property. So that when I uh, hover on it, then it does that tile flip. So it's not just for, I can remove that font and still have that happen on the text itself. Let's do that. What did I do? Okay, never mind. So before I go there, I would like to also, so this is, um, so the custom filters is also available in Chrome Canary, aga again, under our experimental flag, um, but hopefully you'll see much more widespread adoption. The next ones I wanna talk about are things that are not quite there yet. And uh, the first one I'd like to speak about is uh, what is known as blend modes. How many of you use blend modes in Photoshop? Very few. So does, do you know what blend modes are in Photoshop? So uh, in Photoshop, I used to consider myself uh, the better, the way people would judge me as a better graphic designer would be the more blend modes I use, the more textures I create with those blend modes, the better people think I'm a graphic designer. So um, what blend modes in Photoshop allows you to do is to take two layers and then you can say, uh, we can specify on one layer how it will appear uh, when it is in combined with layers beneath it. So you can say it's overlay or multiply or uh, saturate or difference and so on. So uh, my team thought this is a good idea to bring to the web. And so we made a proposal to get blend modes into CSS. And so right now there's no implementation yes, yet, but we have a prototype uh, browser that's out there that Chromium browser that you can use to see how blend modes work. Let's see. So here I have an overlay and I have 
a blend mode called multiply, which is why it is looking the way it is. It's very blue. So in case I make it, uh, let's make it uh, darken, then uh, it changes. The blend mode changes. I can also add a filter, blur 10px. And then I can make it overlay and all of that. What is it? Lighten and so on. So this is still just a proposal. Uh, it's I mean, it's, it's, there is a working draft, but we are still working on it. And um, uh, hopefully, a version of it will be out there in a browser for you to test soon. The next one I want to show you is kind of uh, is not in any spec at all. Like This is something that Apple introduced, and it somehow ships on stable Chrome and Safari but nowhere else, and uh, this is uh, CSS Canvas. So what um, Apple introduced was it's kind of an interesting way of doing animated backgrounds in CSS, which is that uh, you can uh, have a canvas be rendered as a background and not use a canvas element at all to write to the canvas. So here is, uh, let me refresh. So this is a background that's using the CSS Canvas. So if you Notice that says WebKit canvas, and then it has a term called squares. And then I specify the center and whatnot. So this WebKit canvas is just an image value that is being used to render as a background image. And I have a script that actually writes to that canvas. And the way I do it is by using a document or get CSS canvas context. So I don't do get canvas context, I use CSS canvas context, and I also pass in two other additional arguments than typically you get, canvas width and canvas height. And then uh, I write to that uh, context, I just keep writing, I have an animate function that I just write to, and then I have request animation frame, I just keep drawing, except there is no canvas element. If you look here, there's, there's no canvas element, nothing, it just draws to that context, and the because you're using the same name as squares that's being used here. I have a squares here, and I say squares here as well. So it knows that it's being drawn to that CSS context. And that's how uh, this weird, <laughs> bizarre, psychedelic animation got made. Now, uh, there is a similar proposal that Mozilla uh, proposed and actually have also shipped uh, in the stable Firefox, and that's for using elements as background images. So you can actually just uh, link to an element, and that will be used as a background image. And now, uh, someone known as Simurai, who on Twitter, who you should be following, um, made this uh, pretty awesome uh, Kaleidoscope with just the Mozilla element uh, property. So you have one element here, and then that element is being used as the background for the second one. And then uh, the third one uses the second one as a background, and then the so on and so forth. So it's like a recursive uh, loop. And then uh, when you hover on these things, which I don't think you can see here, usually it also does uh, rotate animation. So it's kind of like a psychedelic uh, kaleidoscope. And um, the way you would do that is, uh, where is the style? Yes. So I have an element. And then I have background image, and I have Moz element, and then it links to the ID of the element that it wants to be used as the background image. And so that's how this thing happens. Now, this also has security issues, and it's, I don't think this will be adopted like it is right now in the spec. But there's, and then the CSS canvas that I just talked about is not even in any spec. But I think the CSS canvas is a good way forward that's much more clear and legible than what this is. But maybe in three or four years from now, you'll see something that's a combination of these two out there in a new spec, maybe. So um, this is all the cool stuff that I just mentioned. Um, there is also some of the responsible stuff that is coming up. And one of those is basically known as the ad supports rule. Now, what the ad, what the ad supports rule does is, basi is uh, help you tell you if some declaration is supported or not. So here is, um, so it only works in Opera and Firefox. So I, here I'm testing a font feature settings, and it says it's not supported. And that's true. And then uh, in, in, let's see, 
Wow. This didn't happen. Let me see. Oh, great. Ah, oh, there you go. So I'm having a little. So now it says uh, the font feature settings is supported, which is also true. Um, so let's look at how this works. Style. The way you would do it is you have a rule called add supports. And then I have a declaration. So I just have to put that whole declaration font feature settings, the property, and the value together. And then I have uh, different logical operators I can use. I can use or, I can use and, and whatnot. So uh, here I'm testing for whether it's, uh, the prefix support exists for font feature settings. And then if it exists, then I just output a content. So you could also change the background, or maybe you want to, if border radius is supported, maybe you want to use border radius. And if it's not, then maybe you don't want to use border radius, and things like that. So this is almost like a CSS replacement for a uh, modernizer, if any of you are using that library. And uh, you don't, but again, this does require browsers to support this feature first, uh, if you want to use this. So um, that is all I have for today. I guess I just rushed through this, but um, is there any questions? Well, before anything, I just want to say that you need to be careful with all of these, because most of these are not ready for use. Uh, but I would welcome you to experiment with these things. Just go ahead, uh, try to combine two crazy things together and see what happens. And most of the times, it, they would break and they would uh, expose browser bugs. And that's what we want. We want to make sure that the browsers are ac as consistent as possible and uh, so that when it is ready to use these features, we, it, it, there's a robust set of supports rather than the way Gradients has been or Flexbox has been. So anyways, um, that's all I have for you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Divya. Thank you so much for telling us about the next generation CSS. Any questions from the audience? Nobody. Nobody. Mm. Very well. Oh, there's one here. I'll get it, Thomas. Oh, okay. All right. Um, for the support support uh, attributes, um, I assume if we if we're gonna put that in a browser that doesn't support that, what's gonna happen? If it, is it yeah, it's no use. No, it's no use. Yeah, there's so it's no completely safe, right? I mean, yeah, nothing will happen. Uh, that particular section will just be ignored. Okay. Yeah, so it it's safe to do, but it's just uh, not worth doing for browsers that don't support it. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay.